Welcome back to the Packet Lab. Today we're going to take a look at another in the Building a Cisco Lab series of lessons. And today's lesson is going to concentrate on choosing an access server. And as always, we start out a lesson with a definition. What exactly is an access server? So for our purposes, an access server is going to be defined as a device which you're going to connect to and then from that device be able to connect out to any of the devices in your lab via the console port of those devices. So as you build your lab, you're accumulating equipment. You probably got, you know, a couple 2500s or 2600s, whatever, and you start playing around with them. So you're going to connect your PC or your laptop, fire up your terminal emulator program, uh, connect via the COM port, use your blue Cisco rollover cable, and connect that into the console port of each device. And this is great for one or two devices. If you have to configure one device and then the next, you just go ahead and take that cable, take it out of the console port of device one and move it into device two and there you go. Thing is, is this doesn't scale very well. Once you hit um, three or more devices, it really is to be a pain in the ass. Pretty quickly, you're moving cables around and it starts to seem like you're doing more cable monkey work than you are doing actual labbing. The other capability that you sacrifice is the ability to have your lab remotely accessed. Because in order to do that, you would have to have a dedicated monkey sitting in front of your rack of equipment and moving your console cable on your whim. So with an access server, what you would do is you connect to the access server, whether you're doing that remotely via Telnet or if you're just connecting to the console port of that device and then use that as your central terminal so you connect to that and say okay I'm in my access server let me connect to R1, R3, switch one, whatever. So this is going to give you more lab time and less cable moving. It's also going to open up the possibility of you remotely accessing your rack so that you would telnet from you know the outside world into your access server and then connect to each of your devices from there. So once your Cisco lab has hit the critical mass where you're going to have value from having a dedicated or semi-dedicated access server, you're going to start looking around for one. And there's a number of boxes out there by various manufacturers that are available for this purpose. Uh, we're going to look at using Cisco equipment for this purpose in this lesson and specifically we're going to look at three different options. There's the Cisco 2509, 2510 or 2509 RJ router, the Cisco 2511, 2512 or 2511 RJ router and then finally the Cisco NM, NM stands for network module 16A, A I assume stands for async card and that's a card that you would put into an already existing module router. The first two of these are going to be, because they're 2500s, they're going to be fixed module routers. Anyways, we'll get into that in just a little bit. Let's first take a look at a couple of slides to illustrate the advantage of having a dedicated access server. And I'm calling it an access server. Some people call it a terminal access server, terminal server. I'm just going to use access server going forward in this lesson. So let's take a look at that advantage. Okay, so here we have a simple Cisco lab. You've got four devices. It looks like routers here. You've got your laptop and you've got your Telnet emulator fired up. You're connected via your COM port and you have the blue Cisco rollover cable connected to the console port of R1. You get to configuring and you're like, all right, let's move on to R2. So now what you're going to need to do is actually disconnect this console cable and move it to the console port of R2. Okay, so easy peasy. But you can see how this wouldn't scale very well. If you had, say, a CCIE lab, a CCIE lab is going to run you generally anywhere from 12 to like 16 devices. You're not going to be wanting to be moving cables from device to device. It's going to become a burden rather quickly. And also with this solution, you don't really have a method of sharing out all your devices remotely. I mean, I suppose you could share out this laptop connect to it and then uh, go through the console cable to get to your device but again you'd be limited to one device unless you can get somebody to move that console cable for you so this is the same lab but we're using an access server this device up here is going to be a Cisco 2511 and what we're doing here is we're just connecting to the console port of this device so now in this case I want to get to R1 I am connected to the console port of my access server from there I'm going to open a connection through an async port to R1 do my configuration jump jump back to the access server and say, okay, now I need to go to R4. And there's a dedicated connection to R4. Configure that, jump back. So it's it's a central point where you're connected to that will give you access to all of these devices on their console port. The other advantage that you gain with an access server is that you can have this connected to the internet. So if you've ever rented rack equipment, you've seen this concept in action. You'll actually tell that into the vendor's access server and then from there connect to your rack and have connections to each of your individual devices here. This also comes into play in enterprise support where you can have an access server like this set up out of band. So if 
all of a sudden connectivity to you know your remote site goes down you can have a out-of-band connection to this device and then get to each device on their console port this comes in very handy when you're doing troubleshooting also if the uh, router loses its damn mind you're not able to get to it via telnet or any other connections in here you can always connect in through out-of-band hit the console port get into ROM mon mode and work your magic so this concept is not unique to just a lab situation it can have practical applications in the quote-unquote real world okay a term you're gonna see bandied about with access servers is reverse telnet so what you're doing is you're connecting to your access server in this case let's just say we're telnetting in from the outside world and then you connect to each device via quote-unquote reverse telnet so what the hell is reverse telnet well, here you go. Here's a simple definition. Reverse Telnet is a specialized application of Telnet where the server side of the connection reads and writes data to a TTY line <laughs> through the use of reverse Telnet on such a device. IP networked users can Telnet to access serial connected. Fuck me. I, I'm sorry, but that has got to be one of the shittiest fucking definitions I've ever seen for anything. Here's how I would define reverse telnet for our purposes. Reverse telnet allows you to connect to a device via telnet then make a second connection from that device to another device's console port. Some of you might be looking at this and saying, well, you know, if you're connected to your access server via console port and then you connect out from there to your lab devices via their console port, is it really reverse Telnet? Because Telnet really never comes into play. And the simple answer to that is, I don't know. I really don't care. So if you're at some nerd dinner party and somebody corrects you on this, it goes, eh, that's not really reverse Telnet because there's no Telnet. Just nod at them, smile, give them their semantic win, and then go bone the shit out of their girlfriend. Okay, so we have a number of Cisco-based options for our access server. First off, let's take a look at the 2509 series. And the top device here is a 2509. It's a 2500, so it is a fixed module router. And then the bottom is the Cisco AS 2509 RJ. RJ is registered jack. So the significant difference between these two devices, or there's actually two. In our case, the most significant difference is, is going to be how the async ports are presented. In this in this case, this is our SCSI 268 pin connector, and you're going to go ahead and connect something called an octal cable to that, and we'll see that in just a bit here. Uh, you might hear it referred to as an octopus cable. Basically, you're going to have one end that's a big old 68 pin SCSI connector that connects into that, and then off of that, it's going to have eight dedicated connections that terminate with an RJ45 connection that goes into the console port. With the AS2509RJ, the RJ being registered jack, each async port has its own dedicated connection that, that will take an RJ45 connection. So you could just have rollover cables for this with you know, each end being an RJ45 connection. The other difference, as you can see, is that the RJ router has only a single serial port where the 2509 has dual serial port. This really isn't that big of a disadvantage unless you're going to try to dual purpose your access server, in which case you would want to have this device act as not only as an access server, but also as one of your lab devices, say that you want to have serial connections out of this. In that case, the lack of an additional serial port might be a problem. This AUI here, for those of you that aren't used to the 2500, this is actually, believe it or not, your Ethernet connection. In order to utilize this, you have to have a converter box. They're about the size of uh, like a cigarette pack. They connect on there. They're a big pain in the ass because they get bent and break pretty easy, but it converts this AUI connection to a uh, 10 base T connection. Okay, and I didn't include the 2510 in here. It's going to look exactly the same as this 2509, except this AUI is going to be replaced with a um, DB9 connection, which will be used for token ring. I'm an old dog, but I managed to escape any exposure to token ring, so I'm not sure if the DB connects directly in there or if you need some type of converter. Okay, moving on. Next up is the 2511 series, and basically the same differences apply. Here's your 2511, here's your AS2511RJ, exactly the same as the 2509s, except that you get eight additional async ports. So here you're going to have 16 ports that are going to be served through two SCSI 2 68 pin connectors. And the AS2511RJ is going to have 16 dedicated async ports. And the same disadvantage, if you want to call it that, is that you only get a single serial port with your RJ router. Uh, there is a device called the 2512. I don't have it here, it's much like the 2510. It's going to look exactly like this dog up here, except instead of an AUI that you can use for Ethernet connection, it's going to allow token ring. And I guess I should mention, even if I didn't give a damn about token ring, you might care about this because 
if you're going to use this as a device that's going to be accessed remotely, you're probably going to run and grab a device that's going to allow you to have an Ethernet connection so that you can have this connect to a, a WAN, whether that's, you know, with a DSL or some other device. So you're most likely going to use an Ethernet connection for that unless you've got some crazy home network that's rocking token ring. You're probably going to want to take the 2510 and 2512 out of the mix. Unless, of course, you can get a really good deal on them and you don't plan to share this out remotely. Okay, and then finally, the last two devices, if you want to call that, these are actually cards, are Cisco Network Modules. And the NM stands for Network Module. 16 is a number of connections. A stands for the Async. So you can see here, this is that uh, SCSI 268 pin connection. But you're getting this on a card. And the 32A is pretty cool. It gives you 32 connections. I mean, that's if you really have a big lab, you'll want one of these. But this guy up here, this is, uh, I like this. Because what you can do with this is you buy a card rather than a dedicated router. And then you install it into a modular router. Modular routers are like the 2600 series, 3600 series. Uh, some of the 37s, like the 3725. Anyways, it does mean that you're going to have to buy a router, but if you grab like a 2610, you can grab those guys for anywhere from 20 to 40 bucks on eBay and then slip this card in there. Keep in mind, this is a card. This is not a dedicated device, and you will have to uh, deal with the octal cables because it doesn't have the dedicated async ports. Okay, so I've made numerous mentions of octal cables or octopus cables. You can see why some people refer to them as octopus cables. Here's your uh, SCSI 260 pin connector and then you can see here that you have eight different connections and they're all numbered on this one that terminate with RJ45 connectors that you pop into your console port so you connect this to your router and if you have a 2511 you'd have two of these guys providing you with 16 possible connections and then the other end pops into your device's console ports so that's what an octo cable looks like and like i said those guys will run you 15 dollars up to you know i've seen them upwards of 50 bucks you will pay more for the longer ones try to avoid the three foot ones and go with the uh, 10 foot ones if you're in the fancy pants uh metric speaking areas of the world that basically relates to one meter versus three meters. Go for the three meter ones. Okay, so this slide is gonna show you the router comparisons. I don't have the network modules in there because like I said, they're not really routers. And it has a 25, 9, 10, 11, and 12, and the different flavors of that. Basically, what we're looking at here is that these first three guys are only gonna give you eight async. The last three guys here are gonna give you 16 async. And then the different flavors are based on the type of async ports and then whether you have token ring or ether. So now let's take a look at pricing. And as I note down here, this is completely unscientific. Yesterday I went on eBay and I looked at the buy it now prices. I included the shipping in there with the cost. Uh, basically just to get a ballpark figure for what the pricing is on, in the secondary market for these because these are old devices this is 1990s technology you're probably only gonna be able to get them on eBay let's jump into it so you can see here that the price range is pretty similar for almost all of these the 2509s and the 2511s both flavors run about 150 to you know up to 225 dollars the 2512 which runs higher unless you've got a token ring network that you're itching to use i wouldn't even bother with that guy and then the network modules so you can see here the nm16a is about the same price as grabbing a 2509 or 2511 the 32a is going to run you more it's going to be less common but if you have a really big ass lab then it might be worth the extra dollars in order to buy this Again, read the little disclaimer down here. This is for U.S. If you're overseas, the shipping cost starts to kill you rather quickly. Unless you get into one of the network modules, then you can probably minimize the cost on that because it's just a card rather than a big old pizza box router. Like I said, these costs are not scientific. Uh, it's just a ballpark figure at a fixed spot in time. So this is, you know, September of 2010. These will probably go down in the future. Uh, the big takeaway here, though, is to look and see that the 2509s and 2511s are pretty much the same. And so is the NM16A. So any of these three options are pretty much going to run you about the same cost, anywhere from 150 to, you know, low 200.